Hey everybody, I'm here to talk to you about the Fed's new monetary policy framework. You see, in 2008, everything changed. The Fed changed to an ample reserve policy framework. Before 2008, they had a limited reserve policy framework. So that's right, 2008, they went to an ample reserve framework. Before 2008, a limited reserve framework. Well, before we get into this, we need to discuss what the heck are reserves. Here's the deal. Commercial banks bank at the central bank, which is the Fed in the United States. That's right. Commercial banks like Bank of America or Wells Fargo, they bank at the Fed. And their accounts they hold at the Fed are known as their reserve accounts or reserve balances. Just the same way that I bank at commercial banks, right? And I have a deposit at commercial banks. And by the way, when I make a deposit at a commercial bank, say my savings account or my checking account, that's an asset to me and a liability to the commercial bank. Well, back to the commercial banks and the Fed. Hey, commercial banks make deposits at the Fed. And those deposits they make at the Fed, again, known as their reserve balances, are assets to commercial banks and liabilities to the Fed. Now, if, that, if you didn't follow that, basically what I want you to do is think of reserves as kind of like cash accounts, if you will, okay? So that's right, synonymous with reserves for right now, I just want you to think of cash, okay? We can use those interchangeably. So basically, banks, commercial banks, are holding their cash at the central bank, the Fed. And those accounts are known as their reserve balances. Now, here's the deal, 2008, things change dramatically. We change frameworks from this limited to an ample reserve, or really an abundant or even super abundant reserve framework. So what does that mean? And what happened in 2008? In 2008, the Fed, trying to save the financial markets and the economy as a whole, went in and bought a ton of assets from commercial banks. Government bonds and mortgage-backed securities were the main assets they bought. So they bought a ton of assets from, again, commercial banks. And they made payment for those assets by crediting the commercial bank's deposit accounts, right, those liabilities at the Fed, with an increase in their reserve balance, right? They said, okay, I'll just increase your cash holdings, okay, or your cash deposits that I have for you. That's what the Fed said to commercial banks, or did for commercial banks. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, they bought assets from commercial banks, and in payment for those assets, they credited the reserve accounts those commercial banks held at the Fed. Now here's the deal. Prior to 2008, or right about at 2008, the amount of reserves that commercial banks held at the Fed, or cash they held at the Fed, was about $20 billion. I know, sounds like a lot of money. But by 2014, we went from $20 billion, or commercial banks went from holding reserves of $20 billion, to over $2.8 trillion at the Fed. Well over a 100x increase. That is a huge change. And here's the deal. When we go back to when we had 20 billion or commercial banks had 20 billion of reserves held at the Fed, what that meant was the Fed, by simply changing the supply of reserves a little bit, could change the price of reserves. That's the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate is the price of reserves. See, banks, they loan each other reserves in the federal funds market. And when they, we used to have a limited reserve framework, reserves were pretty scarce. So banks often, if they had some excess reserves, would go in and supply those reserves in the federal funds market. And when banks got you know, um, to a point that they were deficient in reserves or almost deficient in reserves, they would go into the federal funds market and demand reserves. And so what that meant in this limited, that's right, limited reserve framework, the Fed could change this supply of reserves curve, and look at it, it's in the steep portion of the demand for reserves curve. And if I, if you just kind of look at this, just small changes in the supply of reserves could cause fairly significant changes in the federal funds market, or federal funds rate, which is the interest rate for reserves in the federal funds market, okay? So again, the Fed would change this. How would they change the supply of reserves? They would use their number one policy tool prior to 2008. The number one policy tool when you have a limited reserve framework, which is known as open market operations. Okay, so let me put that up here. Open market operations. There is two types of open market operations. They could do open market purchases, buy assets, and therefore provide reserves shifting the supply curve right, or they could do open market sales, okay? Under open market sales, they would sell assets, right? But then they would bring down the reserve balances of those banks. 
So they would sell assets to the banking sector and bring down the reserve balance that those banks had at the Fed. So purchases and sales, they would do these open market operations to change the supply of reserves to change the federal funds rate, which is just really known as a policy rate or a benchmark rate. Basically, it's a foundational rate for other interest rates in the economy. It was their number way to kind of transmit changes in interest rates broadly into the economy was by changing the federal funds rate. And again, their number one monetary policy tool was open market operations. Then, in 2008, remember with all those asset purchases the Fed made, crediting the reserve balances of banks so that those reserve balances increased it by, again, over 100x, and during the COVID era, era over 200x. Well, what happened is this shape right here, well, it began to flatten. Now, I've got these two red marks here. What I'm basically trying to say is I don't have a whiteboard. I don't think anybody has a whiteboard big enough to really show the change. You see, I've got a supply of reserves when we had a limited reserve framework and a supply of reserves under an ample reserve framework. But the distance is certainly not what you're looking at right there, right? Maybe 2x at most, okay? This curve nowadays is way out there. So I've got to kind of put a break in my graph. What's important is the supply of reserves curve is now found in the flat part of the demand for reserves. See, reserves are ample now. Basically, banks don't need reserves that much anymore. The number one reason banks like to hold this level of reserves is they get paid interest for those reserves. And we're gonna get into that. That's called interest on reserve balances. That's right, the Fed pays those banks for those reserves. And we'll get into that in later videos because that interest on reserve balances I'm talking about is now their number one policy tool because open market operations are no longer very effective at changing the federal funds rate. Take a look and remember, I want you to think of this supply curve intersecting this flat part, not really close to the steep part. I want you to think of this demand for reserve curves is quite flat for just really, you know, almost like a hundred feet that direction, right? And so, hey, Open market operations, remember open market purchases that increase the supply of reserves or open market sales that decrease the supply of reserves, they're not going to have much of an effect at all on the federal funds rate anymore. So OMO, the thing I learned about in school and pretty much I've been teaching for most of my life, open market operation, number one policy tool of the Fed, is still a policy tool, but it is no longer at all the number one policy tool because it does not change this number one benchmark interest rate the Fed targets trying to change interest rates more broadly in the economy. So how do they do this now? How do they change the federal funds rate now that their number one two tool has been basically, um, it has become kind of useless to them as far as changing the federal funds rate? Well, they have what's called administered interest rates, administered interest rates, okay? One of them is called the discount rate, and it's gonna be important for understanding this shape of the curve right there. We'll talk about that in later videos. But there's two others, interest on reserve balances, which I've already talked about, and that is IORB, and that's kind of thought of as now their number one tool. And there's this other thing, this overnight reverse repurchase agreement interest rate, basically, okay, or rate, if you will. These are two administered rates. And what they now do, and I will talk to you about this in latter videos, is they change these two rates. And when they change these two rates, this curve, this portion of the curve is going to shift. So here's what they do now. Well, as you might know, right now in 2000, I didn't really have to look at my watch, in 2022, okay, we're in June of 2022, we have a lot of inflation. So the Fed is trying to raise the federal funds rate. So what the Fed is doing is raising the discount rate to raise that portion of the curve, which is actually not all that important, okay? But they're raising also these two rates. And when they raise those two rates, this portion of the curve is also going up. So they're basically increasing the demand for reserves curve, or at least these two flat portions. They're raising them up by changing their administered interest rates. Again, the discount rate, the interest on reserve balances rate, and the overnight reverse repurchase rate. 
Now, I know that's a lot, and I know there's a heck of a lot more to explain, and I'm going to explain all of this in detail in the coming videos, so stay with me, okay? That was number one of a few videos to come, okay? We'll see you in those. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in.